Hi, my name is Mark Syme. I am the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey, and I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the evening services of the Northfield Church for Sunday, July the 10th. We will sing from Songs of Faith and Praise. If you do not have that book, I will give you the number of obviously from our book. I'll give you the name of the song. So if you have a different book or device, uh, you can uh, Google it or get to it and sing along with us. Uh, we will have uh, uh, several songs. We will observe the Lord's Supper and I'll have a message for you, which will dovetail off of last week's message. So let's begin first with song number 103. The title of this song is, He Has Made Me Glad. 103, He Has Made Me Glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. 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 I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. If you would turn to number 477, there is a place of quiet rest. 477. There is a place of quiet rest. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold fast to wait before thee. Near to the heart of God, there is a place of comfort sweet. Near to the heart of God, a place where we our Savior meet. Near to the heart of God, all oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before thee. Near to the heart of God, there is a place of full release. Near to the heart of God, a place where all is joy 
and bliss near to the heart of God. O Jesus, bless me, Send from the heart of God. Hold fast and wait before thee, near to the heart of God. And before we observe the Lord's Supper, if you would turn to number 335. 335. In memory of the Savior's love. 335. In memory of the Savior's love. In memory of the Savior's love, we keep the sacred feast, where every humble, contrite heart is made a welcome guest. By faith we take the bread of life with which our souls are fed. The cup in token of his blood that was for sinners shed. Beneath this banner, thus we sing the wonders of his love. And ear anticipate by faith the heavenly feast of love. We are instructed as we are to sing and to pray uh, and to uh, get into the Lord's word. And we are instructed each first day of the week uh, to gather together and break bread. And that is to observe uh, the Lord's Supper, which he instituted on the night he was betrayed. And uh, as he sat with his disciples, and I know there was uh, some anticipation there there was some angst there there was some lack of understanding there but as we get to look at it in overview we understand the the enormity of what happened uh that night and we understand the enormity of what jesus did for each one of us as jesus willingly gave up his life gave up his physical body shed his innocent blood, uh, and he did that all for the sins of the world. And we need to really, as, as a congregation, it's a, it is a lateral thing because we are a group of believers, but it is certainly a vertical thing. It's a very personal thing between each one that, that observes the supper and his God and his Savior. And so as we gather about the table, we have these two emblems that uh, are so poignant to us, one representing his body and one representing his blood. And so as we make this observation and as we uh, get into uh, the Lord's Supper this evening, help us to remember the magnitude of what happened that, uh, that day. Let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful that uh, in your master plan that you sent Jesus to us. We're grateful that uh, he taught, he performed miracles. Uh, we're grateful that uh, he knew that his end would be a sacrifice. Uh, he knew that his end would be the end of the 
an old law of making sacrifices of animals where he would be the one time and pure and wonderful sacrifice one time for all. And as Jesus hung on the cross, his body racked in pain, uh, we understand uh, uh, what he must have suffered and understand that he did it for us. Bless us if we partake of this bread, his body. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Which we are about to take this uh, grape juice into our mouths. Help us to remember the blood that was shed for our sins, the innocent, life-giving blood that Jesus allowed to course out of his body. Uh, we're so grateful that it is the blood of the new salvation, that it is the blood that washes away our sins. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to recognize the magnitude and the enormity of the sacrifice that Jesus made. As we partake of this symbol, we pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. As we have come to the end of the Lord's Supper, there is also something else we are instructed to do each first day of the week, and that is to lay by in store that which which we have been blessed. Uh, we understand that as we do this, we return back to God, what was his in the very, very beginning. Help us to understand that uh, the church as just stewards of these monies will use them to further your work here on earth, uh, to evangelize, to help those that are in need. Uh, help us, dear Heavenly Father, to give with an open heart. Help us to give with gratitude and help us to give in, in such a way that we understand this is part of what you have instructed us to do. Let's pray. We're just so grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, we have the opportunity to give back. Help us to do so with an open heart. Help us to do so with an open pocketbook. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to understand that uh, it does take money to keep the church running in today's society and that uh, that comes from us so that the church can carry out its mission here on earth. Help us to give and give generously. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The last song that we will sing is number 797. Lord, we come before thee now. Lord, we come before thee now. 797. <clears throat> Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our soul disdain. Shall we seek the Lord in vain? Shall we seek the Lord in vain? Lord, on thee our souls depend. In compassion now descend, fill our hearts with thy rich grace, turn our lips to sing thy praise, turn our lips to sing thy praise. In thine own appointed way, now we seek thee, here we stay. 
Lord, we know not how to go till a blessing thou bestow. Till a blessing thou bestow. Grant that all may seek and find Thee, God supremely kind. Heal the sick, the captive free, in us all rejoice in Thee. Let us all rejoice in thee. I do hope you were able to participate in the singing. Uh, I know the Lord heard our joyous voices and uh, is worthy of the praise that uh, we give to him. If you remember uh, last uh, Sunday evening, I uh, taught a lesson uh entitled authority uh, i would like to take that to the kind of next level and so this lesson will segue on last week's lesson about authority and i have entitled this lesson god's chain of authority now i know some of you perhaps have been in the military if you have not been, even if you have not been, you know enough about the military that there is a chain of authority. It goes from top to bottom, I guess. And um, uh, the, the chain of authority is very, very, very important. Chains of authority work in many avenues of life. They work in corporations. They work in schools. They work in businesses. Well, I'm here to propose this evening that there is a chain of authority when it comes to God. Now, a chain with many links has the ability to transfer its energy from the source to an object that needs to be moved. It's the way chains of command work. Of course, we know this. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And so it's very important when things work uh, by these chains of authority that each chain is a strong and powerful chain. And so we can understand this kind of principle uh, of science to help us understand the principle of how this works in the spiritual realm. Uh, let me put this out there. Bible believers recognize that God the Father is the source of authority in all life but especially in the spiritual realm. And so the question might readily be, how does one get the authority of God, who is in heaven, to us as we strive to live our lives here on earth? Well, I would contend that it comes through a chain. And so, first, God has all authority. He has all authority because once there was nothing, and now there is the universe. Once there is nothing, and God the Creator brought something into being. And in any realm, the one that is the Creator creates something and has the authority to do with his or her creation as he, she or he wishes. It's kind of like inventing something. You invent something and you get a patent for it. And once you get the patent, people can't copy that. 
and it stays under the copyright laws for uh, some amount of years before people and other people can utilize it. Well, uh, it's kind of the way it works uh, with God. Um, God has the authority to do everything because we are his creation. And so, since God created the universe and since God created literally everything, he has the authority over all things, but especially for us, especially over humanity. We find this in the very beginning, in the first and the second chapters of the book of Genesis. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through four, and beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. In Colossians chapter one, verses 16 and 17. So I would contend this evening that the first link of authority is God. God is the first link in his chain of authority. Jesus Christ is the second link in God's chain of authority. While Jesus lived and worked here on the earth, he did nothing except by the power of God and uh, by the power and authority of God. If you don't believe that, go to the scripture. John chapter 8 verse 28 says, I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. Further on in John 12 49, he said, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. Now, how did Jesus get that authority? By the word God gave Jesus to speak. That's why Jesus was able to say, you can't see the Father unless you see me. No one gets to the Father but through me. Nobody gets to the to the first link in the chain of authority without going through the second link. The apostles and the prophets are the third link in God's chain of authority. In Jesus's prayer on the night in which he was crucified, he said this, I have manifested your name to the men whom I, who gave, okay, whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word for the words which you gave me. I have given to them. Jesus gave the words to his disciples who came, who became his apostles. And since the authority of God has the word that he gave the son. The son has given the apostles that word. And so we have the authority of the apostles. The first century church depended ultimately completely on the apostles because they were the ones that had given, been given the instruction. It's what caused Jesus to say to to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. This, this scripture lets us know that the apostles didn't get to make the rules. They could only reveal the rules, the rules that were given to them by Jesus Christ. So to spread the word 
after Jesus had returned back to the Father. The Holy Spirit, through the work of the apostles, selected other men, such as prophets, to receive the word of God. See Acts chapter 8, verse 18. See 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 and verse 10. And so the apostles and prophets are the third link. The guidance of the Holy Spirit is the fourth link in God's chain of authority. Now, you know what? The apostles, and they were called disciples when they followed Jesus for the, some three years, uh, were taught by Jesus during uh, his personal ministry. And remember, these were guys just like us. They were fishermen. They were regular old guys. It was humanly impossible for those men to remember every little bit of the teachings that Jesus gave them. Jesus had taught them. Therefore, Jesus said, I'm going to give you a way to remember all that I taught you. In John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And he went on further to say in John 16, 13, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. And so we have God, we have Jesus, we have the apostles and prophets, and then we have the Holy Spirit as the guide. That is the fourth link in God's chain. The fifth link in God's chain of authority is the fact that the apostles and the prophets wrote the words down. They wrote the words down for men and women right there in the first century to follow. Now, the authority which the Father gave the Son and the Son gave to the apostles, and now the Holy Spirit comes into play, has been put in, has been put in, sorry, has been put into written form. That's why we call the scriptures the Holy Spirit inspired word of God. The Holy Spirit inspired these men what to write. Thus, the authority of God is in the form of everybody who can read and therefore is able to commit their lives to the authority of God. We have a very, very interesting passage that Jesus spoke to the church at Thessalonica. It was in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 13. Here's what he said. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word, which you heard from us, you accepted not as the words of men, but for what it really is, the word of God which also performs its work in you who believe. To that end, when Paul wrote to his protege Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, he explained the scope and the magnitude of the scriptures when he said, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. So we have five chains here. We have God. We have the Son. We have the apostles and prophets. We have the Holy Spirit. And then we have it 
put down in written form. Okay, so we got the Bible, right? Well, there's one chain missing. The sixth and the last chain in God's chain of authority is that the word of God circulated among the churches so that all the churches soon had the authority of God to guide them from the first link to that link. They were put in the form of letters. That's why we read the book of Romans, a letter written to the church at Rome, a church written to the church at Corinth, a, a, you know, a, a letter written to the Galatian churches, to the churches at Ephesus, to the churches at Philippi, to the churches at Colossae. And so the authority of God is now the written word. And as this, these letters circulated to each congregation, each congregation got one of those letters and they circulated from congregation to congregation. Don't you think that they rewrote them? I mean, they were scribes all over the place. They took these letters. They didn't have Xerox machines. They didn't have printing presses. And so they wrote them word for word. And these passages uh, that we have come to know as our New Testament circulated throughout the churches. To which end, in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul said this, when this letter is read among you, have it also read to the church of the Laodiceans. Do you get that? Paul knew. He understand. He understood. See, Paul was third in the link. He was the third link in the chain. He was an apostle and he was a Holy Spirit inspired apostle. But he knew that the word had to be uh, written and he knew that the word had to be circulated. And no doubt when a congregation would receive it, uh, a book from an inspired man, they'd make a copy of it, send it to another congregation. They would make a copy of it. Soon all the congregations had the authoritative word of God to guide them. They had the link back to God. Another example of this principle is found in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, where it says, the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while it is threshing, and the laborer is worth his wages. The first part of that verse is from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, and the second part of the verse is found in Luke chapter 10, verse 7. How was Paul able to quote Luke's gospel? Because Luke's gospel was available to him. Luke's gospel had circulated. Paul had read it. There's evidence that it circulated throughout the known world. Uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found out that that the, the word was found in Egypt, dated about 115 AD. The Gospel of John, probably written at the end of the first century. Thus, about 10 to 25 years after this, the church in Egypt got a hold of it. A fragment of this can be seen all the way in Manchester, England. The, the Gospel, the written word, circulated throughout the world and the evidence is there and so what do we get from all this how do we know that we have God's authoritative word why because we have God's chain of authority all strong links the authority of God 
was given to the Son. Through the Word, the Son was given. The Son said, I don't say anything except the words that the Father has given me. The Son passed those words on to the apostles and prophets, giving them the Word. They got the Word that He got from the Father. The, the apostles because they were divinely inspired, wrote the word down and sent it to various congregations who sent it on to other congregations. We've received that word due to translators who in a dedicated manner took those words and translated them into different languages. We have the Bible in English. We should appreciate what God has done, uh, what he has done to give us his authoritative word. Paul reminds us, he says, you may learn not to exceed what is written. First Corinthians chapter four, verse six. The revelator writes, we should not add or subtract anything from the word. We must not take from the word, we must not add to it. And as Paul said to uh, Timothy in Second Timothy chapter two, verse fifteen, we must handle it accurately. Isn't this wonderful? Isn't a wonderful thought that we have that God has a chain of command that came down to us? We're at the bottom of this food chain. We exist 2,000 years after Jesus walked the earth. Yet we have the truth of God's word because of the way God set this chain of command up for us through his son, through the apostles, through the Holy Spirit, through the written word, through the circulation of that written word. Um, it's amazing. And just the thought of it is, uh, just shows the great wisdom of our creator. The one who created us, who created the universe, created in such a way that we can receive the gift of getting back to God the Father. And you see, that's our ultimate goal as believers to one day get back to the Father, to one day live eternally with God in heaven. And it's only because God has set this wonderful realm up for us and worked everything in such a way that it came right down to us today in 2022. It's pretty nifty, isn't it? In order for us to achieve that goal of getting back to God spiritually, we must be believers and obeyers. We have to obey God's word that has been written down for us. When we look at the plan of salvation, it isn't some capricious thing. It tells us to confess Jesus as the Son of God. It tells us to repent of our former ways. The words of, of God tell us, tell us to be baptized for the remission of our sins and that we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how we get into the Lord. And it's only through that way that we can one day return and live with the Lord forever. And so if uh, you haven't come to the Lord yet, if you've studied and you understand what you need to do, we're here to help you. We can help you via YouTube, but if you get to us, we can help you in any way possible. I pray that this word has, uh, has uh, been beneficial to you. I pray that uh, maybe I know that I learned uh, a little bit by preparing it and um uh, I hope that you've learned a little bit too. Let's all pray together as we close. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your wisdom, your kindness, and your love. We're so grateful that uh, you are a part of our lives, but you're a part of our lives uh, 
that have come down uh, through Jesus and the apostles, through the Holy Spirit and through the written word and through the circulation of that word. It's, it's such a wonderful plan that you put into effect. Right? We're grateful for it and we're grateful that we're a part of it. And, you know, we can believe that the word of God is the Holy Spirit inspired word. And it's the way for us to get back to you. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, and, and keep us strong. Keep our hearts strong so that we can resist temptation. We thank you so much for sending your son to us and the work that he did on the cross. We thank you so much for your Holy Spirit inspired word that we can uh, turn to, to live righteous and godly lives. Continue to bless us. Continue to be with us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. There is none.